It's great to see that it's one o'clock Pacific time here in Vancouver, and it's great to see all of our audience coming in. And again, we'd love to see a hello from you in the chat. Maybe learn where you're joining us from today or how you heard about today's program. And so to get us started, I'd like to say how grateful I am to be teaching, learning, and living on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people who since time immemorial have been incorporating the practice of storytelling and observation in what they do and really informing the best practice of what ocean-wise research and education are able to do in our program. So we're grateful to be able to continue to build that into what we do each and every day, including our Tales from the Deep, Insights from Oceanwise Research live stream of programs. And so I'd really like to give a big warm welcome to Erin Purdy, who is our presenter today from Oceanwise Research. And I'll turn it over to you to say hello. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Aaron Purdy. I'm the program coordinator uh, at the Victoria Office for OceanWise's Marine Mammal Research Team. Um, I am just going to set up to make sure that I can share my screen appropriately and get it all set up. But um, yeah, to start things off, I, I want to acknowledge, um, as I mentioned, I'm in Victoria. so. Uh, I'm actually presenting on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen, uh, Songhees, and Wissanik Nations. And so I also am just incredibly grateful to live and work on this land and uh, be able to present to you all today. Uh, so to start things off, uh, as it says right at the top, I will be presenting on Whale Identification 101. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to walk away with a little bit more confidence on one, how to spot whales in the wild, also how to identify them, and then also hopefully you'll know a little bit about how you can help protect these incredible species as well. So a little look at what uh, I hope to cover. Uh, starting off, I'll talk a little bit about the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. Uh, that's one of the main projects that I work on uh, with uh, my work in here in Victoria, uh, what we do and, and why it's so important. Uh, then we'll jump right in uh, to the whales, what everybody I'm sure is here for. Uh, we'll talk about different cetacean cues, things you can look for when you're out looking for whales. Then we'll get into the actual identification, different tips and tricks you can learn to uh, look for when you're trying to identify different species. And then finally, as I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to help cetaceans. So diving in, we'll see if my presentation works. We are incredibly lucky here in British Columbia. There are over 23 different species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Over four uh, There's four different species of sea turtles as well that all spend the time uh, off the coast in these waters. It's absolutely incredible. Um, however, uh, a little bit, unfortunately, 12 of these uh, populations are listed as at risk under Canada Species at Risk Act. So it's incredibly important that we be able to know where these animals are living, uh, what areas are particularly important for them, and how we can make sure uh, we are protecting them properly. However, um, unfortunately, just down here in Victoria, it's me and one other person, and we're supposed to be covering the entire southern coast of Vancouver Island. Between the two of us, uh, we don't have the energy or the time, unfortunately, to be able to cover all of that different area. If we look at the entire coast of British Columbia, there's over 25,000 kilometers of coastline just in our province alone, making it in almost impossible to uh, monitor all of the different animals that lived on our coast. So that's where we've developed the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. Well, what is this? Well, it's one of the, uh, Canada's longest running and most successful citizen science programs. Uh, what we do is we collect uh, sightings of cetaceans and sea turtles from all across BC's waters. Where do these come from? Well, we have a huge and awesome collection of uh, reporters who volunteer their time to report uh, their sightings into us. These include different people uh, like uh, marine fishers, uh, people who are out recreational, uh, just as recreational boaters, um, uh, 
ecotourism companies and BC ferries, all of these people are, uh, whenever they see a whale in the wild, are going to report it to us to help us learn a little bit about where these animals are. So they send in their uh, reports to us. We currently have over 200,000 sightings and counting uh, over the past 20 years, which is absolutely incredible. And then these sightings are used for many different uh, conservation-based research uh, programs, uh, not just uh, research that we here at OceanWise do, but uh, we actually provide that information to other groups as well. To give you an idea, uh, this is 119,000 sightings, so we're missing a couple, but this is what uh, all of those sightings look like over uh, the past 20 years. Um, as you can see, it is a lot. Uh, it is absolutely incredible that we are able to get all of these sightings. If it was just me and my colleague uh, down here in Victoria, we obviously would not be able to cover that much ground. So we're incredibly grateful to all of the different reporters who uh, report their sightings. So what are these sightings actually used for? Well, just last year alone, uh, our data was used in 16 different research projects. In the year before that, it was 28. Um, and these are a whole bunch of different things. We share our data to uh, different groups to learn about abundance and occurrence, as well as distribution of these animals, uh, to identify different areas of concern or potential hotspots where these animals might be spending a lot of time. Um, it's also used uh, for something called the uh, whale report alert system which helps to increase situational awareness of whales in our waters that's something i'll hopefully be able to get to uh, later on in this presentation um, as well as uh, hopefully soon we'll be providing these information in real time to emergency environmental responders so if there was ever some type of uh, environmental emergency we would be able to provide uh, the information of where whales are um, in real time uh, to let these people know uh, if there's any uh, particular concern for different whale species. So as you can see, um, there's a lot of different reasons why it, it's great to report sightings. So before we get into the actual uh, ID portion of our presentation, I would like to encourage everyone to download the Whale Report app. This is one way that uh, is very easy for you to report your uh, cetacean sightings uh, to the BC Cetacean Sighting Network. Um, not only that, it would be a great thing for you to download right now because it actually has a species ID guide. So if you have access to a smartphone, you can find it uh, in either the Apple um, uh, store or in uh, Google Play. You can download that. Uh, it has a fantastic species guide. I'll be talking about many of the different species that are in uh, that uh, app as well. With that, you'll be able to look at different pictures, look at distribution maps of where these animals are found, and hopefully be able to learn a little bit more easily uh, about how to identify these different animals out in the wild. So I assume everyone immediately downloaded it onto their phones if you don't have it already. So I'm sure you're ready to roll. But let's dive in. Let's talk about uh, whale ID 101. So to, before you can actually identify a whale, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find one. So what are things that you can look for to actually find a whale out in the water? Well, one of the most common ones is the blow. This is uh, when the animal comes to the surface of uh, the water. They're going to exhale out. All of the air that's in their lungs is going to condense in the colder air around them, creating that what looks like a bout of steam coming up out of the water. Um, there are different types of shapes of blows depending on the different species. As you can see on the picture on the right here, uh, this uh, individual has uh, a kind of a more bushy blow. You can probably see that that's coming from a killer whale, whereas the one on the left is much more like a column. That's coming from a larger whale, uh, probably a humpback. So if you're looking for uh, uh, some, a sign that there is a whale, looking for that blow is definitely a good one. However, that's not the only thing that you can uh, identify to spot whales. Other things might be splashes. You might be able to not just see a splash, but hear splashes out on the water on particularly calm days as well. The picture on the right you can see is from a massive animal, once again, a humpback whale that shoots its body up out of the water, smashing down, creating a, a very loud sound and also a very large splash. You also might be able to hear uh, something that sounds almost like running water. This is often the case when you have a group of animals uh, that are all together creating a splashing sound like on the left. Uh, this is probably coming from something like a Pacific white-sided dolphin, where we can have up to 200 individuals all swimming together, creating these splashing noises um, and uh, creating a, a, a quite a sound as well as uh, they're all swimming through the water together. 
So we have blows, an excellent way to find an animal. We have splashes as well. But one thing that people don't necessarily think about is to not just look for whales, but look for other animals as well. By looking at the behavior of other animals, it might be a sign that there are other whales nearby. So if we think about it, if there's a huge collection of seabirds that seem to be diving down, feeding on something under the water, that might be a sign that there's something underneath the water that is feeding on the same prey. This is a, a great thing to look for when looking for uh, some of the larger whales, like uh, the baleen whales, like humpbacks or minkies. Um, they're often associated with big aggregations of seabirds that are all feeding on the same bait altogether, whether that be a small schooling fish like herring or krill. These animals often are found together. Another thing you can look for is uh, some of the prey of these uh, species. If you see uh, fish that are uh, uh, in a large bait ball, uh, kind of making splashes on the water, that might be a good sign that there's a whale close by. Also, if you're looking at seals and sea lions, otherwise known as pinnipeds, if they're looking a little bit on edge, uh, like they're a little scared something might be coming for them, probably a pretty good sign that there is a transient killer whale close by, something that likes to feed on these animals. So there's another good thing to look for is the behavior of other species. And then, of course, uh, we aren't just going to be using our eyes to be looking for animals. We're going to be looking uh, using all of our senses to try to find these animals. As I mentioned before, uh, when an animal comes to the surface and creates that big blow, uh, you can often hear that, particularly on calm days. But if you are downwind of these animals, you can also sometimes smell it. These animals uh, do not have the best breath in the world, and uh, certain species are particularly noticeable uh, just based off of the smell that they produce uh, when they come to the surface and exhale. As I mentioned before, that water running sound uh, from large groups of dolphins or the large uh, sound of a whale coming up and slapping it, either its body or its flukes or its fins onto the water can also be a really good sign uh, to look for when trying to find an animal. All right, so we found, uh, have some cues of things to look for when trying to spot a whale. What are some things that we can look for to try to identify that specific species? We have found a whale, we try, want to try to find out what species it is. Well, the first one is size. Is that whale as big as a brontosaurus? Uh, maybe not the best picture that I have here. I'm not sure if everyone knows how big a brontosaurus is, but if it looks like it's the size of a school bus, that's going to be uh, a little bit different than if it looks like it's about the size of a car. Uh, different species obviously are going to be different sizes, so getting a rough idea of how big it is is going to be super, super useful. You can also take a look at its dorsal fin. Dorsal refers to the back of the animal, so this is the fin that's coming off the back of the animal. Um, does it look low and lumpy like a uh, like a humpback whale? Is it very triangular like you'd see in a dolphin or a porpoise? Or is it that tall, straight, um, charis uh, really charismatic uh, fin that you'd see on a killer whale? These are all different types of things that you'd want to be looking for, both the size and the shape of that dorsal fin. You want to be looking at the other fins as well, pectoral referring to your pecs or the arms. These are the fins that are coming out on either side of the animal. Looking at the size and shape of those is definitely going to be super useful for identifying a species if you're lucky enough to see them. Uh, if it's going to have that uh, weird scalloped edge like in a humpback, a paddle-like shape like in a, uh, a killer whale. Also looking at the colors as well. Certain species can have very distinct coloration on their fins that makes it easy for them, easier for them to, uh, for us to identify them. Then you can take a look at the flukes. This is uh, the tail of the animal. Both the size, shape, and coloration of uh, these uh, tails can uh, be super useful in identifying a species, and in some species, be able to identify individual animals as well. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. But taking a look at the size, shape, um, and coloration of those fins uh, can all be super useful in identifying a species. 
you can also take a look at the color of the animals uh, as well as the skin uh, texture as well. As we can see, this animal in the top left hand corner looks really lumpy. It also has a lot of ectoparasites. These are parasites that are living on the outside of the animal's body. So things like barnacles or whale lice. You can also look to see if they're covered in scars or have distinct coloration. All of these things can be really useful in identifying different species. So. We're going to dive in and talk about some of the most common uh, uh, species found, particularly in southern BC here, uh, and talk about uh, some of the, I'll, I'll be talking about all of these different features uh, to look for when trying to identify different species. I have quite a few species to get through, so we are going to punch through, we're going to talk about the uh, most uh, key identifying features of these animals, talk a little bit about their uh, their uh, history as well, um, and their ecology, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them. So to start things off, we are going to talk about the odontocetes. Now, what does odontocete mean? Odonto means toothed, and seat means whale. Earlier I said the term cetacean. Cetacean just refers to all whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So these are all uh, whales that have teeth as opposed to having baleen. <clears throat> so we, these are some of the most common ones that we have here in British Columbia. As you can see, they do have some uh, similar characteristics, but hopefully uh, you can also identify different ways that you might be able to identify them based off of those key features that we talked about just a moment ago. First one up is the harbor porpoise. This is the smallest uh, cetacean that we have here in British Columbia. It's about one uh, and three quarter meters, so about as long as I am tall. Um, they're also uh, generally uh, found in relatively small groups, only one to five, and usually are kind of shy. I have a video here to show you what uh, the most common sighting you'll see when you see a harbor porpoise. It's just a little fin, just popping up through the water. It's nice and quiet. They like to keep to themselves. They're very gentle. What these animals are uh, going to be doing for in their smaller groups is looking for small schooling fish. Um, so they, uh, people often will see different types of species of dolphins and porpoises uh, bow riding along uh, different boats. That's not something you generally see harbor porpoises doing. They're uh, a little bit more shy, like to keep their distance uh, from different boats as well. They have that small triangular fin and that uh, dark gray uh, back of their body. Usually you don't see the sides too often, but it can be a little bit more gray as well. Now we can see here, this species is very, very similar, the doll's porpoise. Now, I wonder if anyone can uh, identify some different features that uh, might be um, key, you might be able to identify as key identifying features. One of them is that dorsal fin. It also is very triangular, but you can see it has that white uh, trailing edge uh, that is on the backside of the dorsal fin. It also has that white coloration along the side of the body. And as you could imagine, just based off of those two things, people often mistake this species for a baby orca, a baby killer whale. They often think, uh, I saw a baby killer whale all by itself. It had that black and white coloration. I, that's what I swear it was. And I can certainly understand that uh, when you're so used to seeing orcas and pictures and things like that. If you see this coloration, uh, it can definitely be a little bit confusing. However, there is one feature that I'd like to draw attention to. It's called the caudal peduncle. It's my favorite thing to say because peduncle is just a silly word, but the caudal peduncle refers to this hump of mass right behind the animal's tail. This is a huge hump of muscle that is going to allow this animal to travel super fast through the water. These animals, unlike harbor porpoises, um, much more uh, commonly going to be uh, seen bow riding, traveling uh, much more quickly as well as we can see in this video here. That distinct splash is something we see with these dolls porpoises as well. It's often called a rooster tail as it uh, fans up this big splash of water. But these animals are going to be able to travel uh, so quickly because of that caudal peduncle, allowing them to travel very uh, fast and effectively through the water. Now, they aren't traveling fast and quickly all of the time, which makes it a little bit harder to identify from a, uh, a harbor porpoise. So I'm going to take a look at this, uh, take a look at this video, and I want you to see if you can find a key identifying feature to differentiate it from a harbor porpoise.
Now you can probably see both the dorsal fin has a bit of a white coloration, but also that caudal peduncle. You see the fin come up out of the water, and then you see uh, the back uh, side of the animal come up right afterwards. It looks almost like a box that is rolling through the water, whereas a harbor porpoise looks almost more so like a wheel. All right, we've gone through two of the smaller species. We're gonna work our way up in size a little bit and talk about the Pacific white-sided dolphin. Uh, once again, this is a relatively small uh, whale. It's only about two and a half meters long. Uh, but these animals uh, are almost uh, always going to be very recognizable by their behavior. They're very gregarious animals. They like to live in uh, uh, large groups. Um, it can be up to 200 animals uh, that you'd find in a super pod altogether. They can be very acrobatic, jumping out of the water, doing flips. They also sometimes like to ride on the bows, uh, uh, the bow wake or the wake of a boat. Um, but also it has that very clear uh, curved or falcate dorsal fin. It's gonna have that two colors with the darker in front, whiter in the back. And they do have that little small beak at the front if you ever do get to see their faces. So when we look at these three species together, you can see that there are quite a few similarities, but hopefully between the caudal peduncle, the shape of the dorsal fin and the coloration, you'd be able to identify uh, these three different species, as well as uh, taking into account the different behaviors that they display as well. So I'm guessing most people watching think would probably be able to identify this species. It's very enigmatic. Uh, the killer whale is unlike any other whale in the world. It is very easy to identify. They have that tall uh, black dorsal fin. They have that kind of white or gray saddle patch just behind their dorsal fin as well. And then they have that white eye patch as well. One thing uh, to note is that their eye actually isn't located in that white eye patch, but it's actually just a little bit below that. Um, whether or not that white uh, eye patch is to make them look a little bit bigger and scarier, or whether or not it's just to confuse their prey, uh, we're not entirely sure, but uh, it certainly makes them uh, very charismatic and easy to notice. They also are known for having a bushy blow. Uh, when they come to the surface and exhale, it kind of looks like a sphere of steam that pops up out of the water. This is because they, like all uh, toothed whales, only have one blowhole. Larger whales, like baleen whales, have two blowholes, and this makes it go up and kind of out a little bit more, so it doesn't have that bushy shape. Now, killer whales are particularly interesting because not only are they easy to identify, uh, from other species, but you can actually identify the males and females apart uh, relatively easily as well. Females are going to have a more curved dorsal fin, whereas the uh, adult males are going to have a very tall, straight dorsal fin. The uh, juveniles, they all start out, whether male or female, with a more uh, curved dorsal fin, so it's a little bit harder to tell them apart. However, when you have a baby, uh, that is uh, a year old or less, it is uh, going to have kind of a yellow or orangish coloration uh, in the white parts of its body, which uh, makes it very easy to identify as well. So as I'm sure uh, you, uh, as many of you may have heard, well, there are many different types of uh, killer whale, different ecotypes is what we call them. These are all genetically and culturally distinct groups of killer whales that live in the world. There are actually 10 different ones that live in the world but we are lucky enough to have three different ecotypes in our waters. We have the resident killer whales, the bigs, otherwise known as transient killer whales, and the offshore killer whales. When it comes to the residents, we have two distinct populations, the northern residents and the southern residents. Um, and we can actually identify uh, these three different ecotypes apart as well. If we take a look at the uh, dorsal fin and the saddle patch, we are going to be able to identify key identifying features. The saddle patch in a resident killer whale is going to have uh, what's called an open saddle patch as that uh, bit of black coloration uh, cuts down into, uh, into the, uh, that uh, white or gray area. And they have a pointed dorsal fin, but it's going to be pointed more so towards the back of the animal. Transient or Biggs killer whales, they have a closed saddle patch, which means they don't have that black crescent that cuts down in. And the dorsal fin tip is generally going to be pointed, but pointed upwards. 
Now, the offshore killer whales, they're, uh, a, a, as you can imagine, usually found more offshore. They also have a closed saddle patch, but they also have a rounded dorsal fin. So, pop quiz. Taking a look at this picture, I want you to think about what ecotype you believe this one to be. If you guessed resident, then you would be correct. We can see that they uh, don't have a uh, that open saddle patch. That's kind of frustrating because not all the resident killer whales do have that, but some do. But they do have a pointed dorsal fin and it's pointed more towards the back of the animal. These ones, give you a moment to guess. I'll give you a hint, that's land close by. So that's probably not the offshore killer whales. And I just gave you one with the residents. So yes, these are the bigs or transient killer whales. They have that pointed dorsal fin and it's pointed a little bit more towards the top of the animal. We can also identify these different species uh, based off of uh, their behavior as well. Resident killer whales um, are almost exclusively going to be eating salmon species. Uh, when we take a look at their diet, uh, particularly with the southern residents, their diet almost exclusively uh, consists of these Chinook salmon. These are particularly uh, large and uh, fatty fish. It's uh, really easy for them to get lots of energy from uh, hunting these uh, types of fish. So that's the main thing that they're going to be going for. Um, they also tend to travel in uh, relatively large groups which uh, these groups actually fall into matrilines. A matriline is a single mother with her offspring traveling along with her offspring and is considered the base unit for resident killer whale social structure. Um, we can then uh, further group these animals into pods. Pods are different matrilines that are uh, going to be traveling together, spending more than 50% of their time together. We can further classify them into clans these are uh, different pods that all share the same vocal dialect. These uh, animals are capable of producing many different uh, calls and sounds, and these sounds are going to uh, be uh, very distinct between different groups. And then we can group them into uh, different populations as well. Um, the different populations that we have in uh, BC are the southern and northern uh, resident populations. They are considered endangered and threatened respectively, with the southern population having only 72 individuals left in the wild, whereas the northern population thankfully is doing a little bit more, uh, a little bit better, with around 280 uh, members in that, uh, that population. These are uh, the different uh, areas that these animals live, but I am going to move on just so that we can uh, catch up and hopefully talk about a couple of more species here as well. I will quickly touch on the bigs or transient killer whales. These are uh, marine mammal eating uh, animals. They almost exclusively go for other marine mammals. Things like harbor seals are their absolute favorite meal, as you could imagine uh, with so many harbor seals in, uh, in BC. Uh, other things they like to go for are porpoises and seals and sea lions. They generally live smaller groups. So if you see a smaller group of killer whales, it's uh, potentially more likely to be a bigs or transient killer whale. And they generally don't make much noise. Now, when you think about it, that kind of makes sense. These guys are going to be uh, hunting other animals which also have well-developed ears. So if they are going to be trying to sneak up on these marine men, they're going to have to be nice and quiet. Quickly touch on the offshore killer whales. Uh, there is a much less known about these animals because they are so much harder to study, uh, living more offshore. But they do tend to travel in larger groups, uh, but seemingly, seemingly with a more fluid social structure than we'd see in uh, resident killer whales. They are highly vocal and they uh, seem to tend to feed mostly on fish. However, they tend to specialize on one particular type of fish, sharks. Sharks have a, a very rough uh, uh, skin, and because of that, we'll often find uh, these ground down teeth from eating sharks uh, throughout, throughout their entire lives. Things like uh, 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 Pacific sleeper shark, blue shark, uh, spiny dogfish as well, all different sharks that they like to eat. All right. We made it through some of the odontocetes, so we're going to quickly go through uh, some of the mysticetes or baleen whales. 
Um, these are generally much larger whales than the toothed whales. Uh, they have those two blowholes as well, but then the uh, main characteristic is they have baleen instead of teeth. These are plates of uh, what's made out of keratin, so the same thing as your nails and fingernails, in rows along their mouth that they're going to be using to filter feed, taking gulps of water, closing their mouth, lifting their tongue to the roof of their mouth, and squeezing that water out while catching all of the prey inside. So if you imagine yourself with around 400 uh, fingernails in your mouth, that's something kind of like what it's like to live as a whale. First and the smallest one that we have in British Columbia is the minke whale. Minkies uh, are generally uh, very, fairly solitary. They're only about nine meters long, so about the same uh, size as an adult male killer whale. Um, but one thing that's very characteristic about them is that white coloration they have on their pectoral fins. You can see that white band. If you're lucky enough to get up close and personal with one, uh, if you see that white band, then uh, that's a good way to identify them. They also have that uh, sharply curved uh, dorsal fin and a very pointed rostrum or snout. Um, if we take a look in the video here, you can see that clear white band along their uh, pectoral fin and that sharply curved dorsal fin as well. All right, moving forward to the gray whale. This one's a little bit bigger, 14 meters long, about the uh, length of a school bus and a half almost. Um, these animals are found fairly uh, close to water, uh, sorry, close to shore, because these animals like to feed uh, on the uh, floor of the ocean, uh, particularly close uh, to the uh, uh, close to shore. Uh, these animals have much smaller baleen because of that, and they're going to be uh, scooping up, stirring up mud, and uh, feeding on the animals that live in that mud uh, down below. They have that mottled coloration, often are covered in lots of different ectoparasites like whale lice and uh, barnacles. Uh, they don't have a dorsal uh, fin either. Instead, they just have these knuckle-like ridges along the back making them very easy to uh, spot and uh, identify from other species. As I mentioned before, often found close to shore and they like to feed on their sides. They actually tend to prefer one side over the other uh, while they're feeding. And they like to scoop up that mud and feed on the different uh, food within. All right, this is the last species I have, the humpback whale one of the largest species we have in British Columbia, 15 to 18 meters long, so nearly as long as two school buses, uh, just an absolutely massive animal. Um, very easy to identify as well for many different features. They have that very large, broad tail flukes with different colorations underneath. They have these weird tubercles on the uh, front of their, uh, uh, right above their upper lip. Um, these are actually modern. Uh, potentially different uh, sensory uh, systems while underwater. And they have a, that very tall uh, column-like uh, blow when they come to the surface. These are migratory animals. They uh, spend most of their uh, time uh, during the summer up here in uh, British Columbia, up into Alaska as well. But during the winter, they'd like to go down to Mexico and Hawaii to uh, breed, so we don't see them here as much during that time. Um, they have these massive pectoral fins, very easy to identify just based off of that alone with these uh, huge scalloped edges along the uh, leading edge as well, and different colorations along the underside of their tail flukes. Those flukes, uh, based uh, just upon the coloration uh, and the shape of them, we can actually identify individuals based off of solely a picture of that uh, underside of their tail fluke, making it really easy uh, to identify. Um, they also have many different unique feeding strategies, one of which is, uh, I'll play a short video here, called bubble net feeding, in which the animal is going to, uh, potentially working with a group of other animals, blow bubbles in a circle while spiraling upwards. This is going to create a net around a group of prey, whether it's krill or fish, and then they're going to come up underneath it and take a huge gulp uh, and be able to uh, uh, get all of these animals in one go, as opposed to trying to corral them into uh, different uh, groups together. This is a, a small picture showing it, uh, what it would look like as they come to the surface. I'll quickly move on 
This is one of my favorite uh, types of feeding that these animals are known to do. It's called uh, trap feeding. It's imagine if you're a whale sitting in the water and you have your mouth open and you use your fins to move the food into your mouth. It seems to be a very lazy way of feeding, um, but it seems to be coming more and more uh, common amongst whales in these waters, which is absolutely incredible. So those are just some of the species that live in British Columbia. If you would like to learn more, I already mentioned the Whale Report app is a great uh, place to learn about these species. You can also learn more uh, at wildwhales.org. That's the BCC Ascend website. Also many different books, including Marine Mammals of British Columbia is a great place to start. If you'd like to learn more about identifying different species, learning uh, other little tips and tricks on how to uh, point out these different species. And I will just quickly talk about what you can do to uh, protect whales. All of these different whales, unfortunately, uh, that I uh, was talking about today, do face uh, different threats in the wild. Um, things like toxins and a reduction in food supply can uh, really affect uh, different populations, as well as things like noise and vessel disturbance, as well as entanglements. Uh, whales, uh, if they get uh, caught up in fishing nets, uh, discarded fishing nets, uh, it can be really harmful to these animals. And underwater noise uh, is going to uh, have a great effect on these animals as well, particularly because they rely on hearing to explore their world. Um, when you do see an entangled whale, um, it can be sometimes hard to see what type of stress it's in. This is a picture of a humpback whale that is entangled. It doesn't look like very much. But when you see it, what was actually underneath the water, you can see how much uh, distress that animal is in. This is a number that I will have up at the end of my presentation as well, um, is the, for the BC Marine Mammal Response Network. If you ever do see an animal in distress that is entangled or uh, doesn't seem to be uh, behaving normally, that's the number uh, to call to make sure uh, that that animal is protected. Now, I also mentioned uh, the whale report alert system at the beginning of this presentation. This is something that the BC Cetacean Sighting Network uses um, to help protect different whales. By reporting your sightings into the BC CSN, particularly with that whale report app, they're going to be used to help protect that individual whale that you saw. How is it going to do that? Well, it's going to alert uh, pilots of some of the larger uh, commercial vessels in the water when they come within a certain distance of a recent sighting. What they can do with that? Well, they can uh, hopefully be able to uh, avoid that whale or slow down to reduce how much impact they're going to be having on that animal. So if you detect a whale, it comes into us, we verify to make sure that it looks correct, and then it's sent out to these uh, commercial mariners. These are um, only uh, mariners who are trying to avoid whales. Uh, so people who are driving uh, large uh, tankers like BC Coast Pilots, uh, BC Ferries as well as are going to be getting these alerts. Uh, if they come within a certain distance, uh, they're going to get this uh, text message on their phone or potentially an alert on their uh, desktop app. And then they can take different actions, potentially slowing down, uh, altering course, maybe just keeping it in mind, or if it shows up behind them, then just dismissing it. So. The big thing I want you to take away from this is your sightings that you report to the BC Cetacean Sightings Network help protect whales, both through conservation research projects, as well as direct conservation uh, measures like the Whale Report Alert System. So now that you feel that uh, you might be a little bit more confident in reporting uh, and identifying different cetacean species, hopefully you will feel comfortable enough to get out there and report any whale sightings that you see when you're out on or near the water. So with that, thank you so much. I know I, I went a little bit over time here uh, with my, my presentation. There's just so many species that I want to talk about. But uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please let me know, uh, and I'd love to answer. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was fantastic. And I learned so much, and I know that our audience did as well. And I'm excited to now get out on the water so I can hopefully put some of these new ID skills to use. It's great to hear that we actually have some audience members that found out about today's program through whale watching. So hopefully they'll be out on the water using these tips and tricks very soon too. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in for you. 
Um, one was that you covered such a great variety of species that people might find on our coast. And Linda was wondering if we ever see blue whales around here. It isn't unheard of. Um, they are certainly far less common. I have never seen one uh, off our waters, but I think, was it last year or two years ago that there was one spotted relatively close? I think I think it was, but um, they, they, it isn't unheard of to see them, the largest animal that has ever lived, which is absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, they, they do uh, come to our waters every now and then. They're just a little bit less common. Excellent. Well, that's a goal for people to keep an eye out for now. Hopefully they can identify some of these different animals. 100%. And another question coming in is that if folks see wild whales off of the coast of the BC ferries, is that worth reporting? I always say it absolutely is because uh, when you think about it, uh, the people who are piloting uh, BC ferries, they're at the front of the boat. Uh, they're most concerned about things that are at the front of the boat. If you see a whale that uh, is off to the side, perhaps the people, um, uh, the crew members might not have seen that whale. Um, so if you are able to report that in, uh, that is going to uh, maybe not uh, uh, be, you're not going to be uh, protecting that individual whale from the boat that you're on. But if any other boats come by, and if you're on a BC ferries, chances are there's going to be other ferries coming by uh, close as well. Uh, those other ferries are going to get then get that text message alert, uh, letting them know that that whale's close by. Not to mention, it also helps us learn more about the distribution of these animals as well. Great question, though. Excellent. Yeah, definitely a great thing to keep an eye out for. And I know every time I take a BC ferry, I secretly hope that I will see whales off the boat. So Always, yeah. people will see that as well. Um, it was really interesting learning about all the different shapes of the killer whale dorsal fins. And one question came in, um, what causes a dorsal fin to kind of flop left or right? And is that an identifying feature? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It absolutely can be an identifying feature, not only if it uh, flops over to the side, but also if the trailing edge kind of has ruffles along the backside uh, can be a really good identifying feature. Um, what actually causes that um, is the same thing that uh, hopefully doesn't happen to me when I get older, which causes your face to sag. Um, as you get older, the collagen and uh, connecting fibers that are in your skin or in the case with a uh, a killer whale within that dorsal fin are going to uh, lose some of their rigidity. And because of that, it's going to slightly uh, stop to uh, uh, start to potentially flop or, or sag or deform slightly. So it is uh, associated uh, most often with um, older individuals. Excellent. Thank you. That's very good to know and uh, definitely something to keep an eye out for. So we are almost at the end of today's program. So I'll give a final nudge to our audience. If you have any last questions for Aaron, we'd love to see those in the chat. And while those are coming in, one of the questions that I always like to ask is sort of what brought you, Erin, into this field of study? Can you share a little bit about how you got to be with OceanWise? Yeah, uh, so I started out, um, I'm actually a prairie boy. Uh, there aren't many whales in Alberta. Uh, and so naturally I had to get out of there. <laughs> um, I actually started, uh, in marine uh, science, I first um, came, did a, um, a course out at Bamfield Marine Science Center. Um, that's where I fell in love uh, specifically with marine invertebrates as opposed to uh, some of the larger species. Uh, but then I came out here, I did my master's at UBC studying uh, something a little bit bigger, studying stellar sea lions, um, which was absolutely incredible. And now I'm just working my way up to bigger and bigger species, it seems. Uh, after that, I got started here as uh, as the coordinator uh, at the Victoria Office for the Marine Mammal Research Program. Awesome. Oh, that's so exciting to hear. And definitely, I understand that it's a lot harder to see whales in Alberta, for sure. Really powerful binoculars. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're so glad that you could come out and join us here on the coast. 
And so um, I want to give you a really big thank you. And again, our audience, if you'd like to put thank yous or any comments in the chat for Aaron, it was wonderful to have you joining us today. And with that, as we see those final comments come in, I just have a few things to share about what's coming up next for Tales from the Deep. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Perfect. And so it was great to be joined with it by Aaron today. Next week, we are excited to have Matthew Watkins joining us to talk all about plastics in the textiles industry for our clothes and the ocean. And so that will be August 20th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So we hope that if you're joining us today or if you know anyone that would like to join us, next week to help us spread the word and of course to keep track of what's happening with these programs week to week you can always follow the oceanwise events thread on facebook and we'll have reminders that come up each week telling you what to expect and how to link to the program you can also find more information about what's happening with our online programs at education.ocean.org or see the calendar of live stream events at ocean.org slash learn online. And then we'll be posting frequently, not only about these live stream programs, but what else education is getting up to at OceanWise EDU on Twitter, as well as weekly reminders on the OceanWise Research Instagram for what's coming up for Tales from the Deep programs. And so we're so excited to be able to connect with you each week and offer these free live stream programs. And we have had such a great successful summer with the Vancouver Aquarium reopening in late June. But we are, of course, are still finding lots of different struggles financially within OceanWise and the Vancouver Aquarium. So if you like these programs, we would love to have you share and spread the word, let people know that they're happening, as well as support the organization. And you can find out some great ways to connect with us, see what our community is offering in terms of support and donation by visiting vanaqua.org slash support slash community. And so we love that you are here joining us today. And again, a big thank you to Aaron for your fantastic presentation and all those great ways to identify our local marine life here off the coast. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was an absolute blast. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get to see you again soon and we'll be keeping an eye out for all those wonderful whales. So thank you everyone. And we'll say goodbye for this week. Thanks everyone.